Hi, I'm Bethany Hughes and I'm asking some of the big questions in life in the time it takes to have a cup of tea using 40,000 years worth of art and archaeology as my evidence. And today I'm going to wrestle with the thorny issue of love because love is almost literally at the heart of the human experience. So it seems worth trying to explore what love has meant to us as a species through time. And I am completely thrilled to say that a man I don't just love, I adore, who arguably has not just one of the biggest minds, but one of the biggest hearts on the planet, Stephen Fry, no less, has agreed to come on this love excavating mission with me. So we're going to have a chat about why we're in love with love. <laughs> Stephen, hello. How well, lovely. Well, hello, Bethany. Oh, that's, you are so sweet to take time. So I know that you're working in the States at the moment. So thank you. I, I am. I'm just lucky to be working, but I'm also lucky to be talking to you. Are you somewhere where you can get a good cup of tea? Um, let's be honest. Uh, America, uh, America's idea of a, a cup of tea is a, is warmish water with a Lipton's tea bag dropped in it. <laughs> they don't quite understand it. Now, Stephen, we've, we, we've got the delightful task of talking about love. Do you remember when you first fell in love? I do, I do. It was at school. It was the classic sort of lyrical, absurd schoolboy crush and, uh, on another boy. And um, I, I was just absolutely bouleversé, as the French would say. I was knocked sideways. And suddenly Shakespeare's sonnets make sense and, and, and these movies make sense and these song lyrics make sense and nightingales do sing in Berkeley Square and things explode in your head. And, and you are connected with the whole stream of humanity. When we look back over the generations towards the Greeks or the Romans or any other you know past peoples or ancestors of ours we almost believe we made up what we think of as love now that the romantic love of modern Western movies and music and novels is different from the courtly medieval love that you know you're taught at school. Um, even Shakespearean love is somehow different. It's exactly right. We always, everybody always imagines that we're the generation that have invented things. That we're the first generation to invent liberty, or actually even kind of non-binary love, because yes. there are these incredible um, sculptures and statues going right the way back. In fact, like, can I can I show you one? I've got a very 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 beautiful one. Here we go. Stephen, this is over 11,000 years old, so it's Very an incredibly good. early. Just zoom in. It's obviously two people making yeah. love. But the brilliant thing is you can't really quite tell who's male and who's female. You know, they, they haven't got facial characteristics. If you turn it round, it can be a phallus or breasts or just entwined arms, you know. And these were people who, you know, they were living very basic lives. They were hunting gazelles with their pet dogs, but they took time out to create this. And I don't think it's just a fertility symbol. I no, think I... they're exploring the, the passion of love. And, and the runs and the connectedness is extraordinary. If you turned it upside down, it would actually look like a scrotum with a couple of <laughs> testicles. Exactly. <laughs> the Greeks do get something right in that they describe it as this incredibly physical process. You know, they say that Aphrodite is whispering, physically whispering in your ear, or Eros is shooting you down with his poisoned arrows. And of course, we are now beginning to learn how incredibly chemical love is and that when we fall in love with somebody then the neurotransmitters that create dopamine are turned on and our cortisol, cortisol levels you know our sort of stress levels go absolutely mm. through the roof and that suppresses our immune system 
So we are physically love sick, you know, love does make us sick. And then right. I think there's this, this very lovey thing that um, as kind of relationships go on, then oxytocin is produced, which as you know, is this sort of happy, happy drug. Indeed, isn't that perfect? And our immune systems get much better when we are happily in love, which also makes sense. And the Greeks were sort of trying to tell us that, weren't they, with, with some yeah. of the stories? They, they got it. They, they, yes, exactly. What, what we now interpret, interpret using scientific languages and, as an endocrine <laughs> system, they, they, they personalised, which in a way makes it all more memorable. And that's one of the beauties of myth, isn't it? Personalising abstract things into gods or ideas is so much more kind of manageable for us. So we just talk about Aphrodite for, for a little bit because, I mean, my God, what a goddess. And of course, her sometimes son, sometimes consort, Eros, mm. so central to the Greek world, but not a comfortable goddess. In a, in a strange way, she was the most humorless of all the gods. She could not take a joke. Her revenge was implacable. The psyche story uh, she's too beautiful and people are on on the island are talking about her rather than about aphrodite mm -hmm. and eros her son is sent to punish her um and of course eros accidentally um, injures himself with his own arrow and falls in love with psyche and, and and the whole fable becomes like a fairy tale but it is a classic story for for painters because Although myths aren't really allegories, they play with one sense of, oh, what does that mean? And when it comes to Eros and Psyche, or Cupid and Psyche, if you use the Roman, um, it's such an obvious allegorical story because it's about the uniting of the soul, the Psyche, with Eros, desire and physical love. I had my first kiss when I was 12, my first proper kiss. Mm -hmm. And I remember thinking, just this explosion, not physically, but just, you know, emotionally and spiritually. And I just, it would have been great to have had a myth to turn to at that moment. I think uh, Browning, I think it is, isn't it? The, the famous old line, it's almost, it's almost a rancidly famous old line, but you cannot hope to read capture that first fine careless rapture but you you sort of have little shard memory of it and and you're what you it's thrilling when poets and musicians and, and others remind you of it and when you see young people going through it if i see young people holding each other in a cafe or something and looking at each other in that way it makes me feel so sort of affectionate and oh bless it's yeah. still going on you know? yeah. Do you think we could live without love? Oscar Wilde and others have sort of pointed out that it is the unnecessary things that are most necessary to our existence. <laughs> that, you know, we don't need wine. We, we don't need cuisine as such. Um, and we don't need love. Yes, we need sex to reproduce the species. Yes, we need sustenance to put into the holes in our heads in order to keep our bodies alive long enough to mate. You know, so the things we need are not the things that make life supportable. <laughs> life mm -hmm. is only only bearable because of the unnecessary things. Um, and yeah, love is like that. It is a, it is the wine of, of of our emotions, and it's completely unnecessary. And yet, it is a magical extra ingredient. Mm -hmm. And these are the things that that absolutely allow us to to live rather than exist. I suppose.